So hello, everybody. It's uh, wonderful uh, that you've all managed to join us. As you can see, we're a very collection of faces uh, with you this morning. And we're going to inspire you uh, with our Natural Futures um, Collective. So why start with this? Well, um, why start with this? We've been on an amazing journey and we want you to come along with us. And as we all know, uh, we've all had to have a real rethink over the last year uh, as we journey out of, of this recovery, which is why our conference has got economic, social, cultural and nature recovery. And our collective basically embodies all of that. Um, so where do we start and who, who are we? So. Um, Thanks to uh, for, thanks to Laura Sillers, who is the director of NEMA, we were brought together um, as part of a research and development team um, uh, for the Festival UK 2022. That's basically the Festival of Britain. So we, we came together, we put our heads together as a STEAM team, which is science, technology, engineering, arts and maths to go, right, what do we need to do? And um, we came up with something quite interesting and that's that's where our journey is taking us today but we're going to get into that and you'll be able to ask us questions and we may not be able to answer them live but we will answer them and Sarah's going to be in the booth later on but uh, without any further ado let me introduce uh, the team so okay here we go we're going to start with uh uh, Professor Sarah Perks, she's an interdisciplinary curator and writer at MIMA School of Art and Design, that's Middlesbrough Institute of Modern Art, and previously artistic director of Corner House Home in Manchester. So Sarah, if you can give us a wave. There she is. <laughs> okay. Yay. Next, we move on to uh, Dr. Beatrix Schlob Ridley. She's the director of innovation and impact at the British Antarctic Survey. Uh, next, we have uh, Professor Mikhail Karakis. He's an artist and researcher with an established international uh, profile based at MIMA School of Art and Design. And we're moving on next to Sharda Khan, who is the director of Borderlands, which is a new multi-million pound community arts programme uh, based in South Tees and part of a nationwide Creative People and Pro Places programme, which is led by the Arts Council of England. OK, give us a wave, Sharda. Yay. <laughs> and next we have um, Simon McEwen, Professor Simon McEwen. He is also an award winning digital artist and researcher, also based at MIMA. Hi, Simon. Uh, then we've got uh, Dominic Lasardi. He's an entrepreneur and thought leader. I like that term. Uh, on the application of digital technology and one of the founders and former managing director of Animotion based in Middlesbrough. Hi, Dom. And lastly, we've also been joined by Chris Davis, who's going to be leading our nature recovery theme later on. Hi, Chris. And he's the National Nature Recovery Network Partnership Manager for Natural England. Great. OK, so I'm going to ask Sarah first, why here and why now? Thank you, Rachel. So the Tees Valley is a pretty typically nature depleted area, one that was the crucible of the Industrial Revolution, with the river representing a gateway to the world connected by trade, industry, a history of innovation and manufacturing that continues today. And it's not the first time the Tees Valley has inspired a vision of the future. Ridley Scott used the skyline as the inspiration for Blade Runner. In itself, that's a pretty good example of the way that futuristic visions, by and large, are quite grim, dystopian science fiction affairs. But we see something different in this landscape. The environmental legacy of a past revolution and yet the basis for a future with nature recovered and flourishing. The team led by MIMA at Teesside University are united in a common goal to bring together the worlds of art and ecology to get everyone involved in creating that vision of a nature restored future. So the big idea is that we have a mass participatory arts project that brings together the power of art with our deep love of nature to imagine a wilder nature rich future. And we're using the tools that humans have uniquely developed to make dreams into reality, our imaginations and our voices. 
And the little idea is that everyone takes part in our workshops that unleash creativity to produce empathy for our natural surroundings. So there's a new feeling and approach to this project. We really want to challenge perceived stereotypes of environmental work. So we're not burning man, we're not green man, we're not going to use the word man. We're forward thinking, we're inclusive, futuristic, and we want people to feel something new, something exciting and something moving when they take part in natural futures. Thank you, Sarah. That's fantastic. So B, as a, as a scientist on our team, why do we need to use art and culture and creativity to make this happen? Rachel, well, as human beings, our decision making isn't necessarily always driven by our intellect, by the left hand side of our brains. Otherwise, no medic would ever uh, smoke. The way we feel about things, our emotional connection with them, the right hand side of our brain has a very big influence on how we actually live our lives. So while it's absolutely essential that we communicate the scientific evidence of nature depletion, depletion and, and climate change, we need to do so um, while at the same time enabling that emotional connection. The beauty of creation, both the fragility and the strength that can speak to us and motivate us to invest the time and the energy um, to preserve it. So engagement between nature, art and culture can be a fantastic way to create that empathy, to bring out creativity and to build a lasting motivation for conservation action. So that's what we try to do in our workshops. We use a simple um, structure called the Council of All Beings to create that spontaneous empathy with nature. We gather in a group, we set aside our human voices and take turns to speak as elements of nature, as a bat, a mountain, an ice crystal, and speak of how we, as these elements of nature, are experiencing our ex existence today. And then we get to share also our unique qualities, and these are gifts that we can impart to humanity to help nature recover. And these workshops can be run anywhere, in village halls, in fields, in classrooms, and even online, as we had to do during lockdown um, as a team. And when we experienced this together, it was as if a, a spark of magic happened, as we collectively realized that creative potential of a very simple process. So we wondered how amazing it would be to introduce this to a wider and more diverse range of participants. And we think it could just be the tool we need to start on a very hopeful journey. That's fantastic, B. Um, you, you put that so beautifully. So, Mikhail, I'm going to come across to you now because you've had lots of experience um, working on large scale community arts projects. How can we use this? How can we uh, we tap into your talent and get, tell us a little bit? Yes, thank you very much, Rachel. Yes, I'm coming into this uh, from the perspective of an artist and as someone who has also um, worked um, uh, extensively with the theme of um, climate change, um, our environment, as well as with um, different communities. So um, in the past 15 years, I've worked with people uh, that come from different walks of life in different parts of the world. That includes coal miners, pearl divers, shipbuilders, uh, neurodiverse people, nonverbal people, their carers, children, teenagers, young adults. And, um, and what I can reassure everybody is that people love um, um, getting their hands dirty. They, they love being part of, um, of a creative process. Um, so community art, you know, we tend to appreciate what community art offers politically, the fact that it, it's an opportunity for people to get together and it also has the ability to amplify the voices of communities and individuals who are not usually heard, people who might be socially neglected. Um, the, um, there is another side to it, though, which uh, goes back a long time, um, with kind of participatory art, that we tend to think of, think of it as looking a little bit sad, as not being aesthetically beautiful. And what I've been trying to do throughout my career, um, and 
also, you know, by creating projects that exist on on big stages that are seen by millions of people, is to actually um, uh, show that um, community art um, is not only politically rigorous, it can also be aesthetically uh, rigorous. People's visions of themselves, people's voices, people's narratives of what they what they imagine their lives to be like can also be spectacular. They can be um, beautiful things. So uh, for everybody to to see. So this is where I come from, and this is what uh, this project can offer in terms of this kind of artistic vision. Wow, that's fantastic, Mikhail. And we're very pleased to have you and the other artists on the team uh, to bring all your amazing experience and inspiration. So I'm going to pick up something that you mentioned there and ask um, Simon a question. Um, there's a bit of an issue with diversity and nature connectedness. Um, so tell us about how we've been talking about this issue and, and how it can be addressed. Yes. Morning, Rachel. Um, I spend a, a great deal of my time working on e equality, diverse, diversity and inclusion. And of course, there are often words that seem like they're just tick boxes. And I just wanted to mention the work in the last three years that it's starting to shift that away from being a, a kind of tick box approach and certainly one that it underpins this collective. My work is, is like Macau's, is very collaborative and I usually work with communities of disabled people, including people with learning disabilities. And I firmly believe in my work in EDI, in equality, diversity, inclusion, that if we're looking to, to contribute to solving the world's problems, such as climate changing and rewilding and so on, not only must we uh, work with all communities, we, we, we mustn't be exclusive. We cannot solve these in the, the challenges that, that are developing and will continue to be developed if we uh, only support an exclusive elite. By default, we should not exclude people. So, um, and of course, exclusion leads to really dangerous situations. And, and the UN highlights how, for instance, disabled people are, are often excluded in when um, the world is under catastrophic stress in terms of war and other, other dimensions as well. The UK is a, a global leader in research. It, it has um, a, a fantastic history of, of innovation. And three years ago, it set up a body called UK Research and Innovation, and I worked with them in terms of EDI. UK Research and Innovation manage a budget of £14.9 um, billion, pounds, um, and that's an amazing amount of money. And what's really interesting is how the work uh, of UKRI is starting to really recognise that diversity is fundamental to solving our problems. And B, who's in this call as well, will we'll comment on the work of, of de developing inclusivity at British Antarctic Survey as well. So looking to the future, I'm absolutely committed and, and I'm personally committed to EDI, but I think we can also be assured that from a, from a, a national standpoint and a government standpoint that there is a massive shift to diversity and the funding of diversity and a recognition that maintaining a very narrow focus on problem solving doesn't work. How's that, Rachel? That's brilliant. And it's, it's been um, a part of the, <laughs> it's very much, that's great, Simon, thank you. That's very much been a part of the uh, collective conversation that we, we've had, fortunately, um, over the last, uh, last year. Um, OK, <laughs> sorry, my screen's shifting around a little bit, if I thought it funny. Um, the least, the most, hang on, how do I put this? The, the least diverse uh, sector, working sector. Um, so it's really great that we, we've got this as our core uh, uh, for, for this for this for this program, this project. I'm going to move on now to Sharda. And um, so I've got a very simple question for you, Sharda. Who exactly are we hoping to work with? Thanks, Rachel. I think as Simon and Kyle have very eloquently shared in one word, everyone. We're adopting a really targeted approach to actively include all our communities, but especially those underrepresented voices to ensure that we can encourage and support anyone and everyone to engage and participate. 
The way we'll do this is be by working with existing partnerships and networks such as faith groups, youth workers, uh, education providers, LGBTQ plus forums, as well as cultural and nature sector partners. However, as a number of us have already shared, we recognize that many of our communities are significantly less able to share, um, to engage with nature. So one of the ways that we're addressing this is by having a really robust engagement framework, which will additionally target communities who are particularly marginalized and disadvantaged. And, and I think for us, this is very much an opportunity to bring all our community together uh, and our country, sorry, to connect not only around nature recovery, but also wider healing and well-being. And again, this is not just us. There are people all over taking this issue into their own hands in order to break down those barriers and that limited access. Um, there are all these brilliant grass, new grassroots associations bringing up like Black Girls Hike, the Accessible Countryside Project, Black to Nature uh, and the Gay Outdoor Clubs. These are just some of the projects that we're going to work with uh, and amplify along with Wildlife Trust, the RSPB, and the British Eco Ecological Society, who are all starting to think about diversity and inclusion more carefully. I think this focus on inclusion is crucial for a range of reasons, not only because we have a responsibility to reflect the society that we live in, but simply climate change affects everyone, as does nature recovery. Brilliant, Sharda. And of course, you're the director of an, uh, of an amazing programme, the, the Creative People and Places programme. So it's a fantastic opportunity to, to tap into that um, because that, that's throughout England, isn't it? You're, you're sort of a family of, yeah. of programmes um, already working with a lot of these, of these communities. So that's a great resource. Thank you, Sharda. So, um, OK, who am I going to uh, ask next? Um, right. I'm going to come back to you, B. Um, so, uh, Natural Futures gives a message of local and global connectedness, symbolised by the presence of the Antarctic, acting as a kind of beacon to send sounds and images to remind us of the greater interconnectedness of the planet. So, B, can you tell us a bit more about the presence of the Antarctic in this? Yes, Rachel, with pleasure. Um, Antarctica isn't only an enchanting place of outstanding natural beauty, uh, but it's also a sentinel of change. The warming climate threatens the breeding grounds of such iconic species as the emperor penguin. It makes ecosystems more susceptible to invasive species. It messes with the food chain of that rich marine wildlife we have in the Southern Ocean. And this means that limiting the damage caused by climate change is absolutely essential to preserving this iconic natural habitat. And what happens in Antarctica certainly also affects us. Um, the huge glaciers we have there are melting and they are a major cause of sea level rise globally, threatening coastal habitats for people and wildlife alike um, anywhere across the globe. So that's why we are rather keen to represent this Antarctic voice to remind us of how interconnected our fates are and how nature recovery and climate action need to go hand in hand. Thanks, Rachel. Yes, th thanks, B. And it's really special that we've got the British Antarctic uh, Survey involved um, because well, it, it's like a little jewel, isn't it? That that connects us to the to the wider world. This sort of, uh, but I can I'm not going to say any more because Beatrix put it so beautifully. Now I am going to move on uh, to Dom as now, um, because we've touched on inclusion and diversity, and um, I, I guess that's part of your answer when I ask how can this project make the best use of technology? Um, as <laughs> take it from here, Dom. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, I mean it's been a. It, the project itself, even its uh, uh, creation, was uh, generated in kind of a virtual virtual sense, given what had been going on over uh, the last few months. Um, so really, it was very much embedded in the opportunity to create a wider voice for everybody and leverage technology in such a way. So you know, one of the great things that we planned here is a, you know, a workshop approach. That workshop approach could be done physically in person, but could easily be done uh, on, online in a virtual sense, which meant we could all of a sudden cast the net much further than what we were originally considering for a project like this, which uh, starts to give us some really inciting input uh, and some trackable data, actually, as part of the process that we were going through. Um, but then we also plan to uh, uh, not just use 
the technology for the platform for communication uh, internally, but around uh, the outputs of the the group as well. So using social media, uh, tagging where we are in the the process, sharing what the outputs of the the uh, uh, workshops are. And we started to look at how we could uh, build in some interesting technologies to allow us to have virtual uh, visualizations of uh, at the outputs of the project, looking at how we could create augmented reality within the projects as well. So uh, we experienced, uh, we expressed an idea around using props and costumes and masks, heads attire, and where that would be unavailable using things like augmented reality to create a, a further deep impression around the, the impact that the natural world has around us and how we can all be part of that and how we can all sit in that space. So it was quite exciting, the opportunities that uh, brought to us by a technology and really the way that we felt uh, that we could give the greatest impression of applying technology to this approach is, is what we don't see. You know, great, the great thing around technology is we can create a different lens into the natural world and show, expose everybody to a world that they might not see on a day-to-day basis. But through technology and through conversation, we can actually create almost a virtual window into a natural future. That's fantastic, Dom. Yeah, and we've all had a bit of a, a taste of that, haven't we, over the last year? And of course, um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we're trying to imagine what is a restored future? What is our landscape going to look like when, when we get on board with this, uh, with all these ambitions to, to have uh 30% of our land recovered by 2030, if, if that's the right quote. So it's great that we've got these amazing technologies to, to tap into uh, and that will fuse into this project. Um, it's a great collaboration. So um, I'm going to move on now to Chris, uh, because um, we had this amazing idea. We, we've had this real sense, um, and as both Sarah and B uh, and, and all, all of the team have touched on, this isn't just about using our, our data and our heads and our minds to connect up and go, we need to respond to the, the nature and ecological crisis. We need to feel it too. And there is an actual growing body of, of research out there about nature connectedness. And in fact, Natural England that uh, Chris works for has done quite a, quite a bit of research. Uh, and I think it's the University of Derby as well. I've got a fantastic um, resource out there, which shows that nature connection if we're really going to um in, in really change nature we need to have this this empathy with nature which is what our our um our our program is all about so chris you are the nature recovery network partnership manager for uh for for natural england it's going to cover england you're going to talk about more about that of course in our nature recovery section but it's relatively new it's ambitious it's long term um Given what we've been uh, we've been talking about uh, and the importance that we feel that culture has in us imagining nature recovery, how do you think this is going to work uh, and, and and integrate it into the work that you're doing? Thanks, Rachel. Um, it's I mean it's it's been an interesting uh, journey for me personally uh, because I mean going back a few quite a few months now, Sarah and Rachel came knocking our door saying we've got this great idea, come and engage with this. And I think it was a first, we were still very early on in the Nature Recovery Network planning. And I think it sort of challenged us to suddenly go, actually, arts and culture do have a role here. Uh, and actually, they have a really key role here. We don't quite know what that role is yet, but we need to start engaging with the sector to understand the benefits that arts and culture could bring to the Nature Recovery Network. You know, coming from a very standard traditional conservation background it uh pushed me out of my comfort zone which is a good thing we need to be challenged in this world um and i think engaging in this project did two things to me one is to for us to make sure there was a check on inclusion and diversity within the nrn program as a whole and i think that's been really important for us to do that and we have had quite a lot of conversations to ensure that we are being as inclusive as possible and we are making big steps on that. And the second thing that sort of challenged us to go is how do we engage the public in this change? The Nature Recovery Network is going to deliver a massive change across all landscapes in England over the next 20 years. We need to engage the public in that process. We need to tell the story of change. 
Uh, and I think Rachel and Sarah really woken my eyes to going, all right, well, arts and culture have a role in telling that story. And it, it actually came, um, well, we're on just at the right start of that, that process. And we probably speak now every week within my team about the role of arts and culture. How can we integrate arts and culture within the planning process? And, and just to have those conversations is a change that we've never done that before. Uh, and we, you know, we're really hoping to find some funding to maybe run some pilots this year. We're thinking about how to um, integrate arts and culture within our annual conference. So it's really starting to change. And, you know, fair play to you guys. You came and knocked on our doors and you started that conversation. And I picked up on something that Sir Mark Rylance said in an article um, last week. Uh, where he just wrote about nature and arts. And he said that arts should tell love stories about nature and stories to awaken compassion, to awaken people to make a change. And I thought, yeah, that's what we need to do. <laughs> I don't know how to do it yet, but we, that's what we need to do. So uh, thank you for coming and knocking on our door and starting that conversation we don't know where it's going to go but i'm really excited about it and we certainly see that there is a central role in arts and culture within the nature recovery network well that's fantastic and i think yeah <laughs> i could yeah it's fantastic uh, uh chris and I guess now, I mean, after the, the mad year that we've all had, I think we're all a little bit more comfortable about talking about our feelings and about empathy and uh, connecting emotionally with each other and with the, the, the natural world. And that's really what we need, don't we? So to fall in love with, with nature again so that we can help restore ourselves and restore nature. So connecting, connecting this is four of our projects. Natural futures crosses the culture sector with the environment sector and with cities, all of whom share skills and creative uh, creativity unlocks all of its potential to launch a totally new chapter for nature recovery. Thanks, everybody. And um, that's that's it for us. You're going to head now uh, across to uh, economic recovery. See you later.